Should the State Support the Arts? By Frederic Bastia, read by Gennady Stolyarov II. Ought the State to Support the Arts? There is certainly much to be said on both sides of this question. It may be said, in favor of the system of voting supplies for this purpose, that the arts enlarge, elevate, and harmonize the soul of a nation, that they divert it from too great an absorption in material occupations, encourage in it a love for the beautiful, and thus act favorably on its manners, customs, morals, and even on its industry. It may be asked, what would become of music in France without her Italian theater and her conservatoire of the dramatic art, without her théâtre français, of painting and sculpture, without our collections, galleries, and museums. It might even be asked whether without centralization and consequently the support of the fine arts, that exquisite taste would be developed, which is the noble appendage of French labor, and which introduces its productions to the whole world. In the face of such results, would it not be the height of imprudence to renounce this moderate contribution from all her citizens, which, in fact, in the eyes of Europe, realizes their superiority and their glory? To these and many other reasons, whose force I do not dispute, arguments no less forcible may be opposed. It might, first of all, be said that there is a question of distributive justice in it. Does the right of the legislator extend to abridging the wages of the artisan for the sake of adding to the profits of the artist? Monsieur Lamartine said, If you cease to support the theatre, where will you stop? Will you not necessarily be led to withdraw your support from your colleges, your museums, your institutes, and your libraries? It might be answered, If you desire to support everything which is good and useful, where will you stop? Will you not necessarily be led to form a civil list for agriculture, industry, commerce, benevolence, education? Then, is it certain that government aid favors the progress of art? This question is far from being settled, and we see very well that the theatres which prosper are those which depend upon their own resources. Moreover, if we come to higher considerations, we may observe that wants and desires arise the one from the other, and originate in regions which are more and more refined in proportion as the public wealth allows of their being satisfied, that government ought not to take part in this correspondence, because in a certain condition of present fortune, it could not by taxation stimulate the arts of necessity without checking those of luxury, and thus interrupting the natural course of civilization. I may observe that these artificial transpositions of wants, tastes, labor, and population place the people in a precarious and dangerous position without any solid basis. These are some of the reasons alleged by the adversaries of state intervention, in what concerns the order in which citizens think their wants and desires should be satisfied, and to which, consequently, their activity should be directed. I am, I confess, one of those who think that choice and impulse ought to come from below and not from above, from the citizen and not from the legislator, and the opposite doctrine appears to me to tend to the destruction of liberty and of human dignity. But by a deduction as false as it is unjust, do you know what economists are accused of? It is that when we disapprove of government support, we are supposed to disapprove of the thing itself whose support is discussed, and to be the enemies of every kind of activity because we desire to see those activities, on the one hand free, and on the other seeking their own reward in themselves. Thus, if we think that the state should not interfere by taxation in religious affairs, we are atheists. If we think that the state ought not to interfere by taxation in education, we are hostile to knowledge. If we say that the state ought not by taxation to give a fictitious value to land or to any particular branch of industry, we are enemies to property and labor. If we think that the state ought not to support artists, we are barbarians who look upon the arts as useless. Against such conclusions as these I protest with all my strength. Far from entertaining the absurd idea of doing away with religion, education, property, labor, and the arts, when we say that the state ought to protect the free development of all these kinds of human activity without helping some of them at the expense of others, we think, on the contrary, that all these living powers of society would develop themselves more harmoniously under the influence of liberty, and that under such an influence no one of them would, as is now the case, be a source of trouble, of abuses, of tyranny and disorder. Our adversaries consider that an activity which is neither aided by supplies nor regulated by government, 
is an activity destroyed. We think just the contrary. Their faith is in the legislator, not in mankind. Ours is in mankind, not in the legislator. Thus, Monsieur Lamartine said, Upon this principle we must abolish the public exhibitions which are the honor and the wealth of this country. But I would say to Monsieur Lamartine, according to your way of thinking, not to support is to abolish, because setting out upon the maxim that nothing exists independently of the will of the state, you conclude that nothing lives but what the state causes to live. But I oppose to this assertion the very example which you have chosen, and beg you to remark that the grandest and noblest of exhibitions, which has been conceived in the most liberal and universal spirit, and I might even make use of the term humanitary, for it is no exaggeration, is the exhibition now preparing in London, the only one in which no government is taking any part, and which is being paid for by no tax. To return to the fine arts, there are, I repeat, many strong reasons to be brought, both for and against the system of government assistance. The reader must see that the especial object of this work leads me neither to explain these reasons, nor to decide in their favor, nor against them. But Monsieur Lamartine has advanced one argument which I cannot pass by in silence, for it is closely connected with this economic study. The economical question as regards theaters is comprised in one word, labor. It matters little what is the nature of this labor. It is as fertile, as productive a labor as any other kind of labor in the nation. The theaters in France, you know, feed and salary no less than 80,000 workmen of different kinds, painters, masons, decorators, costumers, architects, etc., which constitute the very life and movement of several parts of this capital, and on this account they ought to have your sympathies. Your sympathies! Say, rather, your money! And further on, he says, The pleasures of Paris are the labor and the consumption of the provinces, and the luxuries of the rich are the wages and bread of 200,000 workmen of every description, who live by the manifold industry of the theaters on the surface of the Republic, and who receive from these noble pleasures which render France illustrious, the sustenance of their lives, and the necessaries of their families and children. It is to them that you will give 60,000 francs. Very well, very well, great applause. For my part, I am constrained to say very bad, very bad, confining this opinion, of course, within the bounds of the economical question which we are discussing. Yes, it is to the workmen of the theatres that a part, at least, of these 60,000 francs will go. A few bribes, perhaps, may be abstracted on the way. Perhaps, if we were to look a little more closely into the matter, we might find that the cake had gone another way, and that those workmen were fortunate who had come in for a few crumbs. But I will allow, for the sake of argument, that the entire sum does go to the painters, decorators, etc. This is that which is seen. But whence does it come? This is the other side of the question, and quite as important as the former. Where do these 60,000 francs spring from? And where would they go if a vote of the legislature did not direct them first towards the Rue Rivoli, and then towards the Rue Grenelle? This is what is not seen. Certainly, nobody will think of maintaining that the legislative vote has caused the sum to be hatched in a ballot urn, that it is a pure addition made to the national wealth, that but for this miraculous vote, these 60,000 francs would have been forever invisible and impalpable. It must be admitted that all that the majority can do is to decide that they shall be taken from one place to be sent to another, and if they take one direction, it is only because they have been diverted from another. This being the case, it is clear that the taxpayer who has contributed one franc will no longer have this franc at his own disposal. It is clear that he will be deprived of some gratification to the amount of one franc, and that the workman, whoever he may be, who would have received it from him, will be deprived of a benefit to that amount. Let us not, therefore, be led by a childish illusion into believing that the vote of the 60,000 francs may add anything whatever to the well-being of the country and to national labor. It displaces enjoyments. It transposes wages. That is all. Will it be said that for one kind of gratification and one kind of labor, it substitutes more urgent, more moral, more reasonable gratifications and labor? I might dispute this. I might say, by taking 60,000 francs from the taxpayers, you diminish the wages of laborers, drainers, carpenters, blacksmiths, and increase in proportion those of the singers. There is nothing to prove that this latter class calls for more sympathy than the former. Monsieur Lamartine does not say that this is so. He himself says 
that the labor of the theaters is as fertile, as productive as any other, not more so, and this may be doubted, for the best proof that the latter is not so fertile as the former lies in this, that the other is to be called upon to assist it. But this comparison between the value and the intrinsic merit of different kinds of labor forms no part of my present subject. All I have to do here is to show that if Monsieur Lamartine and those persons who commend his line of argument have seen on one side the salaries gained by the providers of the comedians, they ought on the other to have seen the salaries lost by the providers of the taxpayers. For want of this, they have exposed themselves to ridicule by mistaking a misplacement for a gain. If they were true to their doctrine, there would be no limits to their demands for government aid. For that which is true of one franc and of sixty thousand is true, under parallel circumstances, of a hundred millions of francs. When taxes are the subject of discussion, you ought to prove their utility by reasons from the root of the matter, but not by this unlucky assertion, the public expenses support the working classes. This assertion disguises the important fact that public expenses always supersede private expenses, and that therefore we bring a livelihood to one workman instead of another, but add nothing to the share of the working class as a whole. Your arguments are fashionable enough, but they are too absurd to be justified by anything like reason.